All right, so today we're looking at the King archetype. If you haven't watched my first video, I highly suggest you go watch it. It's an introduction to Jungian archetypes. Uh, I just thought some terms out there, you know, try to get you guys acquainted with what I'll be talking about. But uh, yeah, if you haven't seen it, go watch it. And yeah, this is this is the King archetype. All right, so as I stated in part one of the series, each archetype has a man psychology and a boy psychology. Now, this doesn't mean when you're a man, you have that psychology, or if you're a boy, you have that psychology. Some men have boy psychologies, they never grow out of it. Uh, and I mean, arguably, maybe some boys have man psychology, you never know. But uh, so the boy psychology, so the king is the man psychology, the boy psychology of the king archetype is the divine child. Uh, and a popular story that kind of shows off the divine child is Jesus when he is a baby. Um, Jesus is almighty, even when he's a baby, yet all vulnerable. He's the center of the universe as the wise men come to him and, and animals surround him. Uh, he's the center. Um, and it's interesting, psychologists who have tended to patients, according to Robert Moore, as patients get better, they often dream of a baby boy that is that has this energy about him that is refreshing, new and creative. And often these men who are, as they get better, they want children. So that's an interesting thing to note. But yeah, the divine child is new, creative, and as well innocent. The divine child is fragile, just like baby Jesus, and will be attacked by evil with, within themselves and without themselves. And we can see this with the evil King Herod in the story, uh, who is an evil tyrant, uh, decides to kill every baby boy in an effort to kill baby Jesus. As word gets to him, uh, a new king has been born. And in more practical matters, as, as men who go through psychotherapy, as they get better, uh, a little voice comes in their head saying, no, you're not getting better. You'll never be, you'll never be better. Uh, and that's kind of the inward evil, the inward king, e evil King Herod attacking baby Jesus. Now, according to Robert Moore, there's a patient who went in for, for psychotherapy. And when he was five or six, he, he talks about the story. When he was five or six, uh, he was yearning for something, but he couldn't quite put his, his finger on what he was yearning for. So he, he goes outside and he sits under a tree and he begins singing and humming. And as he goes along, he just makes it up and birds begin to flock to him slowly. And he, it's almost like he's under a tree of life now. Life begins to show up around him and acknowledge the boy's creativity and, and youthfulness and freshness. And that's kind of what the divine child, that's kind of the point of it here. Uh, Freud described this primitive energy as the id, which is immoral, forceful, and full of godlike qualities. Uh, it's capable of satisfying the endless needs of a child. So again, the divine child is the center of the world, yet hopelessly vulnerable, full of potential, but yet it needs lots of assistance to, to make sure it stays safe. Uh, and Jungian saw the divine child as being part of the self, not the ego, uh, which had powerful qualities of joy and enthusiasm for life. And it's important to differentiate the ego and the self as the ego is only one part of the self. The self is everything, everything about you. But the ego is just, the ego is what you're aware of. It's, it's your ability to channel actually what you are. Now there are two shadows for the divine child, which is the high chair tyrant and the weakling prince. Um, so the high chair tyrant, I'm sure you've seen this before. You've seen kids who are just kicking and screaming for their mom to bring them more food or, or who knows what they want. And they're never satisfied with, with what they get. They believe they're the center of the universe and everything is there to serve them. Now, some men actually stay in the stage and sometimes even very successful men stay in the stage, but they're, they're perfectionists and, and it's impossible for them to fulfill their own standards and expectations so they punish themselves just as their mother would punish them when they would throw tantrums and they're a slave to the high chair tyrant so just as their mother had to do every need of the two-year-old now the man has to fulfill every need of that two-year-old who can never get enough now each shadow has a bipolar side and the bipolar side of the high chair tyrant is the weakling prince um this is this is an individual who needs to be coddled uh, every smallest wish is their parents command uh, often they're a hypochondriac and they have very little enthusiasm for life and what's interesting about the shadows it's not it's not a kid is this shadow or a kid is that shadow it's it's like a slider so what you often see is like with someone who's who's known as the weakling prince a uh, very reserved very kind of needs to be tended to but often when they get to a certain point they will throw tantrums like the high chair tyrant and become the high chair tyrant while as the high chair tyrant will throw tantrums and when he's not getting what he wants he'll withdraw 
and he'll be very reserved and very apathetic. Now this is scary obviously because the divine child obviously needs a lot of care because it's very easy to go into these shadows, but it's, it's a very important archetype that needs to be taken advantage of. Uh, it drives freshness, newness, and creativity. Um, but what's interesting is most men actually don't need help um, disassociating from the divine child. They actually need help getting in touch with it. So most men uh, aren't encouraged enough to, to identify, to acknowledge their own divine child, their limitless potential for greatness within them. So the trick is to connect to the divine child, to, to acknowledge it, but not identify with it. It's interesting, the ancient Romans believed every baby, girl and boy had their own genius within them, a very unique genius. So what's interesting is birthdays were not actually there to celebrate the boy or girl. The birthdays were there to celebrate their own inner genius. And when we see men and women who create great art, music or writings, it's often not their ego that does that, not the part that they're aware of. It's their, it's, it's the divine child within them, some aspects of them that they're not even aware of. So the question we have to ask ourselves as we're looking at, at, now that we know that we have a divine child within us and we know about its shadows, it's not whether or not we are manifesting these shadows, it's, it's to what extent are we manifesting these shadows. And men tend to retreat into a kind of boy psychology when they're tired or weak or stressed. So when they're, when they're just really out of energy, they'll retreat and kind of enter this kind of uh, hopeless stage and they're backed into a corner. So if you feel as though you are manifesting one of one one of these shadows or both of them at times, you have to ask yourself, how are you honoring this divine child within you, this genius within you, this limitless potential, and how are you blocking him? So the king is the matured archetype of the divine child. Uh, it's the most important as it's the center of the archetypes. Of, as I've said, the king needs to be a good warrior, it needs to be a good magician, it needs to be a good lover. Uh, if you don't know what those are, again, go watch the first video. I go over that a little bit. So in history, a king is seen as sacred, uh, but it's not the man who's the king. That's not important, his qualities, his personality. It's the energy he exudes. Uh, it's what he radiates. Um, there was a man who went in for psychotherapy, according to Robert Moore. He had this dream and he was a great hero. He could do anything. He would fight, fight great battles and he was, he was legendary. But soon, uh, he's being chased into a tunnel by it having to be the Chinese army. And at the end of the tunnel, he meets the Chinese emperor. And he has no choice but to kneel and submit to him as he looks up at this emperor who's just radiating this kind of king energy. Uh, but the king looks compassionate, not angry at all, like he almost as if he knows what position the warrior's in right there, like he's been there before. Uh, and the king says to him, you know, you're going to be executed in three hours. And the hero knows this and he accepts his fate. Uh, and, and this is, this dream kind of shows the boy psychology submitting to the man psychology. It's, it's, you're great, you have a lot of potential within you but you're not limitless. There's there's things you need to understand. There's wisdom you have to garner, and that's kind of the king. So the king, just like the divine child, sits at the center of the world, and all creation stems from him. Now, the only difference is, is the king knows his limits, as the divine child didn't, and that's kind of in the hero's story. It's the reconciliation of the, the boy ego with the father. Uh, the father is wise now. He, he's become something where he knows his limits, and he knows how to structure things the way he wants to. Um, so the world that is ordered is his kingdom and everything outside of that is chaos. I don't know if you guys watch Jordan Peterson at all, but uh, an exercise, it's kind of a meme now, but an exercise he, he says to do is, is to clean your room. And it, it's actually, it's funny, but it's actually very important because it's, it's, he's, it's an exercise to establish your king energy because that's exactly what the king is. His realm of being, he orders. Everything outside of that is disorder. So if everything around you is disorder, you're not a very good king, you know? So the king is mortal, but he has this kind of divine energy, an energy to create order, codify laws uh, for his subjects to follow. And that's what we do. We we give ourselves structure. And 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 what's important too is the king needs to embody his principles himself and his kingdom will, will run smoothly. You know, when we, when we think of our kingdom, we think of our relationships, our families, our friends. We, that's everything, that's order, that's, our, that's what we know, that's our kingdom. How are we ordering it? And do we embody the principles that we are telling people? And that's important because or else, you know, the kingdom won't run smoothly. In other words, 
things will go south in your life if you are doing some if you're saying something and doing another so the king is also generative and and fertile you know god says to be fruitful and multiply uh, the king is a fatherly figure who helps others be generative and he blesses men. And this is very, this is a very important point because this is kind of what's lacking today. It's this king energy from, from older men to bless young men. Uh, psychological research, according to Robert Moore, actually shows a chemical change in a person when they feel blessed. So when a young person, you know, does something, creates something, they need to be acknowledged by someone who has this kind of king energy. So think about, you know, you're a young man and your mentor, you know, acknowledges your work or acknowledges your action. It's, it's necessary. You have to be acknowledged by some, someone or something you respect. So we tell young men to get it together, but they're starving for this king energy and they need to be blessed. They need to be seen by and acknowledged by the king. And that's, it's an archetypical story, you know people enjoy being acknowledged by someone in that kind of authority and power. So what is a king in his fullness? What does it look like? Well, the king is generative, he's reasonable, he's calm, he's centered, and he brings order to a chaotic inner and outer world. So inwardly and outwardly, he brings order to it. He doesn't like being in chaos. He wants everything orderly and structured. There's two shadows to the king archetype. The first one is the tyrant, and the second one is the weakling. Um, so we'll look at the tyrant first. The tyrant is not generative as the king is, but he's destructive. Uh, this can be seen again with the story with baby Jesus. King Herod kind of embodies the shadow tyrant, uh, the, the shadow of the tyrant. Every, he kills every baby boy in an effort to kill baby Jesus, who he hears is the new proclaimed king. Now, a good king, a king in his fullness, is securing himself enough to bless others and help others be generative. While the tyrant, the tyrant has this insecurity and, and paranoia within him that he can't let anyone else have the spotlight. He has to destroy everything and put everyone else down so he keeps his power because he knows he doesn't actually have within him what is necessary to be respected by his subjects to remain in power. So another biblical story we can look at is the story of Saul and King David. Uh, Saul looks to kill David, who is proclaimed the new king, and he's told, God no longer wants Saul to be king, but it's too late. Saul's ego now identifies with the king. Um, and, and that's a big problem because the king energy is to be used and channeled, not identified with. Um, narcissists have the shadow. They literally believe they are the center of the universe and everything is everything and everyone is there to serve them. So the bipolar shadow of the tyrant has a different problem. It's known as the weakling. Uh, he wishes to be identified with the king as the tyrant is, but he feels helpless. He doesn't have the power to do so. Um, he screams people to adore him and to appraise him, especially people that he feels are superior to him. And he projects this weakling archetype onto others, usually people who he feels is weaker than him. So the superior friends, he screams to, adore, to, to have them adore him. If they were less superior than him, he would flip that switch very quickly and begin to... Um, bully them and cut them to size. Now a man who kind of embodies these kind of characteristics, usually when they're kids, they are not cut down to size enough by their parents. So their parents kind of tell them all the time, even when it's not true, just how great they are and how they can do nothing wrong and like they're they're a gift from God. But it also happens on another scale, the other when a kid is abused heavily by their parents and they're so discouraged that they don't even realize what's within them and they're start they're they're starving for this need to be acknowledged by others. So a good medium for parents then is, is to encourage the child enough um, to experience their own divine child, but not enough to identify with that divine child. You know, there's, as the Romans said, there's a genius within you, but you serve the genius. It's, you know, it's not, you aren't the genius. The, the person's not important. It's the thing that's within you. So accessing the king archetype means to acknowledge you have it, to know you have the ability to structure your life and people around you. Uh, you have centeredness, you have you can be calm, you know what you're doing, but don't identify with the king energy. A good way to think about it is, is a planet surrounding the sun, right? So we have our sun, it's life-giving. We orbit it. Without the sun, we wouldn't exist. But that planet cannot get too close to the star. And if the planet thinks it's a star and tries to go close as close as it can to the sun, um, it will be destroyed. And that's kind of a way to think about it. So the ego serves the king energy, and it's not to... 
It's not to embody it to benefit himself, it's to benefit his kingdom and his subjects. So the tyrant identifies with the king energy and has no commitments or priorities. He is the priority, that's the difference. Um, and the ego, again, has to maintain proper orbit around the king or else it will be eaten up by the king energy. Another story we can, we can look to is Satan and God, where Satan believes he is God and tells him, I am God, and he, he ends up being destroyed. The passive side, the weakling, is usually someone who just is so starved of the king energy, they, they, they're, they get to a point where they're looking, at, looking for it in other people. Um, they're impotent and can't act on their own. They're not decisive. They don't know, they, they don't know what to do. Um, think of a husband who tends to their wife's every need and desire and, and gets bullied around because they can't stand up for themselves. Uh, and we can see that in history with, let, let's say, Hitler in, in World War II. Um, you have a lot of men who just didn't have someone to guide them, so they, they look to Hitler as this king, and they're just going to follow his every order, and they were, they were led to destruction that way. And I mean, fortunately, there were some men in Nazi Germany who had their own king energy. They knew what was right, and it didn't matter what other people were doing, and, and, they, and they used that energy to be helpful. Um, but a lot of men didn't, and, and it costed them their lives. So in a couple of good exercises then to, to really put this into practical terms is first, you know, putting in order your immediate being, so your room, for example, uh, put, in or, put that in order so you know exactly you are able to structure things. If you're in school or a job, structure that accordingly. Have a good schedule, you know. Uh, believe in what you are saying and live by your philosophy. Those, those are probably the best things to do. Um, and if you don't feel like you are really acknowledging that king energy, you kind of almost need to pretend, you know, pretend just that you do have that king energy. And soon you'll believe it. And soon you'll, you'll realize that you have this this divine energy within you that you can use to be generative and help others who are who aren't as who haven't recognized their own genius within them yet. So that's the king archetype in his shadows. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. What you think about the archetype? Um, any questions? If I miss some points, I know it's a lot of information, but a very interesting archetype, and it's and it's the center. Uh, so any questions or anything that I, I left out, please leave in the comments. Let me know what you guys think about it. Um, the next part will be part three, and we're going to do the warrior next, the war archetype next. So thank you guys for watching. I really appreciate it.